the Dual Vocational Institution, often referred to as DVI, was once a fortress for some of the most feared gang leaders and members in California. For decades, this facility, located in Tracy, California, was the last stop for criminals whose names became synonymous with danger. In August 2021, DVI closed its doors permanently, ending an era that many thought would never be forgotten. But the stories of those who walked its halls, those who commanded fear and respect within its walls, remain as chilling as ever. In this video, we delve into the lives of the top six most dangerous gang leaders who were once confined within DVI. Their actions shaped not just the prison's history, but also left an indelible mark on the world beyond the prison gates. Their names still echo in the corridors of the criminal underworld, reminding us of the dark legacies they left behind. Number 6. Melvin Yu of the Chung Ching Yi Gang Melvin Yu is a Chinese-American triad gangster born in 1961 who was a key member of the Chung Ching Yi, also known as the Joe Boys, a notorious Chinese youth gang in San Francisco during the 1970s. The gang, originating from Hong Kong immigrants, was involved in a bitter feud with the Hua Ching Gang, another Chinatown-based group. Melvin Yu's name became infamous due to his involvement in the Golden Dragon Massacre, one of the most brutal and shocking gang-related incidents in San Francisco's history. This massacre, coupled with his criminal activities at the dual vocational institution, DVI, cemented his reputation as a dangerous figure within the gang world. The Chung Ching Yi, or Joe Boys, was formed in the late 1960s after a faction split from the Hua Ching gang. Melvin Yu, who joined the gang at a young age, quickly rose through the ranks due to his ruthlessness and loyalty to the gang's cause. By the time of the Golden Dragon Massacre in 1977, Yu had secured a prominent position within the Joe Boys, acting as one of their most trusted and feared enforcers. On September 4, 1977, at around 2.40 a.m., the streets of San Francisco's Chinatown were quiet when a blue Dodge Dart pulled up on Washington Street. Inside the car were five members of the Joe Boys, including Melvin Yu, all armed and masked, ready to execute a brutal attack. Their target was the leadership of the Hua Ching Gang, who were believed to be dining at the Golden Dragon Restaurant, a popular Cantonese establishment. The attack was intended as retaliation for a long-standing feud that had escalated earlier that summer of July 4, 1977, where a shootout at the Ping Yuan housing project had resulted in the death of Felix Huey, a Joe Boys member, and the wounding of Melvin Yu himself. The massacre was to be the Joe Boys' bloody retribution. As the masked gunmen entered the Golden Dragon restaurant, chaos erupted. They opened fire indiscriminately with shotguns and a submachine gun, sending the terrified patrons diving under tables for cover. Despite the intense barrage of bullets, the intended targets, the Hua Ching leaders, managed to escape unscathed. However, the carnage left behind was horrific. Five people were killed, and 11 others were seriously injured. None of the victims were gang members. One of the most chilling aspects of the massacre was the cold-blooded execution of Paul Wada, a young law student. Melvin Yu, armed with a 38 Walter revolver, walked up to Wada and shot him at close range, continuing to fire even after he had fallen to the ground. The massacre, which lasted less than a minute, was later described as the worst mass murder in San Francisco's history. The aftermath of the Golden Dragon Massacre led to a massive manhunt by the San Francisco Police Department. The Asian Gang Task Force was established to tackle the rising gang violence in Chinatown. Melvin Yu, along with the other perpetrators, was eventually arrested. Yu was apprehended in March 1978, and his trial revealed his leading role in the massacre. Number 5. Robert Maxfield of the Crips Gang Robert Edward Maxfield, a member of the Southside Compton Crips, is a figure whose criminal activities have cast a long shadow over his life and the lives of others. The Southside Compton Crips, a notorious gang operating in Compton, California, is known for its violent turf wars and involvement in substance trafficking. 
Maxfield's affiliation and membership with this gang positioned him as a key player in its violent operations, a role that would eventually lead to tragic consequences. Maxfield's most infamous crime is his involvement in the murder of Yatunde Price, the half-sister of tennis superstars Serena and Venus Williams. On the night of September 14, 2003, Maxfield and another gang member opened fire on a vehicle outside a suspected crack house in Compton. Inside the SUV were Yatunde Price and her boyfriend, Roland Wormley. The two gang members mistakenly believed Wormley was a rival gang member and fired on the vehicle in what they thought was a defensive act. Yatunde Price was hit in the back of the head by an AK-47, and she died instantly from the gunshot wound. This brutal act of violence shocked the Williams family and the world, bringing to light the harsh realities of gang violence in Los Angeles. Yatunde Price was a 31-year-old mother of three, a nurse, and a part-time personal assistant to her famous sisters. Her death was a profound loss, felt not only by her family but also by the broader community. Maxfield's legal journey was marked by multiple trials. Initially charged with murder, Maxfield faced two mistrials before pleading no contest to voluntary manslaughter in 2006. His plea came on the eve of what would have been his third trial. The plea deal resulted in a 15-year prison sentence, a significantly reduced charge from the original murder charge. Maxfield had already spent nearly three years in jail by the time of his sentencing and went on to serve almost 12 more years in prison. Maxfield quickly rose through the ranks, becoming a significant figure within the Crips gang. His involvement in criminal activities, particularly in the dual vocational institution, further solidified his reputation as a dangerous and influential member of the Crips. During his time at DVI, Maxfield's criminal tendencies were amplified. He became known for orchestrating violent acts within the prison, often targeting rival gang members. His ability to navigate the prison's underground network made him a key player in the Southside Crips operations, even from behind bars. His activities within the institution were marked by intimidation, violence, and a relentless pursuit of power, further highlighting his dangerous personality. In March 2018, Maxfield was released on parole after serving 12 years of his sentence. His release was controversial, particularly because of the nature of his crime and the impact on the Williams family. However, Maxfield's freedom was short-lived. He was rearrested in Compton later that year for allegedly violating his parole. The specifics of this violation remain unclear, but it underscores the challenges of reintegration for individuals with violent criminal histories. Robert Maxfield's current status is uncertain. After his rearrest, he was briefly held in jail before being released again. The lack of clarity around his parole status and the nature of his violations leaves his future in legal limbo. Whether Maxfield will face further incarceration or remain free on parole is a question that may yet be answered by future legal proceedings and uncertainty around records that speaks of his present whereabout. Number 4. Raymond Lee Washington of the Crips Gang Raymond Lee Washington, born on August 14, 1953 in Los Angeles, California, was the youngest of four sons, growing up in a turbulent environment that would shape his path toward infamy. As a child, Raymond was known for his muscular build and readiness to defend himself. He was raised by his mother and stepfather after his parents separated when he was two years old. Despite his mother's belief that Raymond was a good kid who only fought in self-defense, others in the neighborhood saw a different side of him. They remembered Raymond as a bully who used his strength to control those around him, even though he sometimes directed that aggression at outsiders who threatened his neighborhood. By his teenage years, Raymond had developed a reputation for trouble, repeatedly clashing with the law and being expelled from various schools across Los Angeles. During the late 1960s, South Central Los Angeles was a breeding ground for youth crime, particularly in the Watts neighborhood. With the older African-American street gangs like the Slossons and Gladiators fading away, new gangs began to emerge, filling the void left behind. 
Raymond, still in his early teens, was drawn into this world and joined a local gang called the Avenues. However, a violent altercation with the gang leader's younger brother led to Raymond leaving the Avenues after being severely beaten in retaliation. Determined to carve out his own space in the gang culture, Raymond formed his gang, the Baby Avenues, recruiting other local youths to join him. This group would eventually evolve into what would become the Crips, one of the most notorious street gangs in Los Angeles. Raymond's criminal activities escalated rapidly, and by 1974, at the age of 21, he was arrested for a serious crime and sentenced to five years at Dual Vocational Institution in Tracy, California. Raymond was now the first Crip to be incarcerated at DVI, a place known for its hardened criminal population. His presence at DVI was met with hostility from other established black prison groups, particularly the black Muslims and the black guerrilla family, who were determined to prevent the Crips from gaining a foothold in the prison. These groups viewed Raymond's efforts to recruit young African-American inmates into the Crips with disdain and made it clear that his attempts to expand his gang's influence within DVI would not be tolerated. Raymond's time at DVI was marked by intense conflict as he was held responsible by other inmates for the actions of the Crips on the streets of Los Angeles. As the Crips continued to clash with rival gangs in Los Angeles, Inmates at DVI who had lost family members in these conflicts directed their anger toward Raymond. Surviving in such a hostile environment required constant vigilance as Raymond's life was under threat from those who blamed him for the pain and violence inflicted by his gang. Despite these challenges, Raymond's reputation as a dangerous figure remained intact as he continued to navigate the treacherous dynamics of prison life. After serving his sentence, Raymond was released from DVI in 1976 and returned to Los Angeles. However, he found a city that had changed dramatically during his time in prison. The violence between the Crips, Bloods, and other gangs had escalated to new heights, with firearms becoming the weapon of choice in conflicts that were once settled with fists. Raymond was reportedly shocked by this development as the gang culture he had helped to create had grown far more deadly in his absence. Raymond's life came to a tragic end on August 9th, 1979, just five days shy of his 26th birthday. That night, he was approached by individuals in a car while standing on the corner of East 64th Street and South San Pedro Street in South Central Los Angeles. Raymond, who typically avoided interacting with strangers, seemed to recognize the occupants of the vehicle and engaged in a brief conversation with them. Suddenly, one of the individuals pulled out a sawed-off firearm and targeted Raymond, inflicting fatal injuries. Despite being rushed to the hospital, Raymond did not survive. His death marked the violent end of a life steeped in criminal activity, and the case remains unsolved, with no suspects ever being arrested. Number 3. Joe Fong of the Chung Ching Yi Gang. Joe Fong, a Macanese American former gang leader, was a figure who instilled fear and commanded respect in the streets of San Francisco's Chinatown. Born as the sixth of ten children, Joe and his family emigrated from Macau to the United States when he was just eight years old. At an age when most children are concerned with school and play, Joe found himself entangled in a world of crime leading to a conviction for burglary by the time he was 11. By the time Joe was 15, he had already become a prominent figure in the Hua Ching, a youth gang initially formed to protect Chinese immigrants from harassment. However, as the gang evolved, its activities shifted from protection to more nefarious operations, including running illegal gambling parlors. Joe's dissatisfaction with the direction of Hua Ching led to a split. In 1971, he founded the Chung Ching Yi, later known as the Joe Boys or Joe Fong Boys. His gang quickly gained a reputation for being one of the most dangerous in Chinatown. Joe Fong's rise to power was swift and brutal. The war between the Chung Ching Yi and Hua Ching escalated, resulting in a series of violent confrontations that shook the community. By 1973, 13 lives had been lost in this struggle 
with Joe Fong being at the center of the chaos. His gang was known for their ruthlessness, and their presence in the Richmond district of San Francisco marked a period of terror for many residents. In October 1972, Joe Fong's life took a dramatic turn. He was arrested early one morning, accused of being involved in a drive-by shooting that targeted individuals associated with the watching. The incident took place near Hyde and Sacramento streets, where multiple shots were fired into parked cars, narrowly missing the occupants. Joe was apprehended at a local cafeteria shortly after the shooting, and eyewitnesses placed him at the scene, leading to his conviction and a life sentence. While Joe was imprisoned at Dual Vocational Institute near Tracy, California, his reputation as a gang leader continued to grow. Despite being behind bars, he maintained influence over his gang, and his name was often associated with various criminal activities both inside and outside the prison walls. His incarceration did not diminish his status. Instead, it reinforced the image of a man who was dangerous, even from within the confines of a prison cell. Joe's life in DCI was marked by a series of incidents that only added to his notoriety. He became a figurehead for many young inmates, some of whom saw him as a leader who could provide protection and guidance in a harsh environment. However, Joe also found himself in the middle of controversies and investigations, especially after the Golden Dragon Massacre, a notorious event in Chinatown's history. Although Joe was not directly involved in the incident, his name surfaced repeatedly in connection with those who were. Despite the violent nature of his past, Joe Fong's story took an unexpected turn after his release from prison on November 12, 1979. Determined to leave his criminal life behind, Joe enrolled in the College of San Mateo and later transferred to UC Davis, where he earned a bachelor's degree in political science. His commitment to education did not stop there. He went on to obtain a master's degree from UCLA, transforming himself from a feared gang leader into a respected scholar. Where Joe Fong is today remains largely a mystery. After his release and subsequent academic achievements, he faded from the public eye. Whether he is living a quiet life somewhere, reflecting on his past, or continuing to contribute to society in ways unknown to the public is something of a mystery not on public record. Number 2. René Boxer, Enriquez of the Mexican Mafia René Boxer Enriquez, born on July 7, 1962, in Artesia, California, emerged from a middle-class background only to become one of the most feared figures in the Mexican Mafia. Raised by immigrant parents who had hopes for their son's future, Enriquez's life took a drastically different path one marked by increasing involvement in crime. Though he showed promise in school, he dropped out of Cerritos High School by the ninth grade, favoring the street life over education. Influenced by his older brother, Mark, who was already entrenched in the gang life, Enriquez quickly found himself drawn into the local gang, Artesia, 13, Arta, 13. By the age of 12, Enriquez was fully initiated into the gang, and his criminal activities rapidly escalated. He started by breaking into homes and committing petty crimes, but soon his involvement grew more severe. By his early teens, he had already become a regular user and dealer of illegal substances, and his run-ins with the law became more frequent. Following a string of armed robberies, Enriquez was arrested and sentenced to prison in his late teens. It was during his time at the Duel Vocational Institution that he first encountered the Mexican Mafia. While at DVI, Enriquez began his ascent within the gang, gaining recognition for his ruthlessness and willingness to carry out the gang's orders. His reputation as a dangerous individual was solidified when he was involved in a violent attack on another inmate, a gang member from Los Angeles, who narrowly survived the assault. Enriquez's notoriety only grew when he took the life of an imprisoned member of the Vagos Motorcycle Club, known as Chainsaw. These acts demonstrated Enriquez's commitment to the Mexican Mafia and his willingness to carry out their most violent orders without hesitation. In 1985, Enriquez's loyalty and violent efficiency earned him the status of a full-fledged member 
or carnal within the Mexican mafia. His influence within the organization expanded as he played a significant role in structuring the gang's operations both inside and outside the prison system. The gang's control over a vast network of street gangs and criminal enterprises was solidified, with Enriquez at the forefront of this expansion. His leadership extended beyond mere criminal activities, as he was also involved in strategic decisions that helped the Mexican Mafia exert its influence over various territories in California. Upon his release on parole in 1989, Enriquez continued his involvement in the gang, now tasked with extorting money from local criminal enterprises and overseeing operations in his assigned territory. His role in the gang was not limited to extortion. He also took the lives of those who defied the gang's authority. One of his most infamous actions during this time was ordering the termination of a suspected informant, Cynthia Gavaldon, whom Enriquez believed was withholding money from the gang. In another instance, he personally ended the life of a fellow gang member, David Gallegos, for fleeing a confrontation, administering a fatal dose of a substance before ensuring his demise. Enriquez's criminal activities eventually led to his arrest for the termination of Cynthia Gavaldon. To avoid the possibility of a death sentence, he accepted a plea deal that resulted in a life sentence. During his incarceration, Enriquez continued to demonstrate his dangerous nature, exemplified by an attack on Mexican Mafia leader Salvador Mon Buenrostro in the Los Angeles County Jail where he and an accomplice inflicted multiple stab wounds on their target, although Buenrostro survived the attack. Despite his cooperation, Enriquez's past continued to haunt him. California governors repeatedly denied his requests for parole, citing the immense risk his release would pose to his safety and that of others. However, in July 2022, after years of legal battles and several parole denials, Enriquez was granted parole. Number 1. Rodolfo Alvarado, Cheyenne Cadena of the Mexican Mafia Gang Rodolfo Alvarado, Cheyenne Cadena was born on April 15, 1943, in San Antonio, Texas, into a family of second-generation Mexican immigrants. His early years were marked by a difficult transition as his family moved to Bakersfield, California, where he faced the challenges of growing up in a tough neighborhood. It was here that Cadena began his journey into the world of crime, eventually becoming a prominent figure in the Mexican Mafia. Cadena's criminal life began at a young age. In 1959, at just 16, he and Richard Ruiz, who would later become a key figure in Mexican Mafia, were involved in a violent incident outside a dance hall known as Salon Juarez, where a man was fatally assaulted. This act of violence led to Cadena's arrest and subsequent incarceration at Duell Vocational Institution, DVI, a correctional facility known for housing young offenders. Despite his age, Cadena quickly earned the respect and admiration of other inmates, particularly those involved in the nascent Mexican Mafia. His charisma and ruthlessness made him a natural leader, and he soon became deeply involved in the gang's operations. While at DVI, Cadena's reputation as a formidable and dangerous individual only grew. One notable incident occurred shortly after his arrival when a large, intimidating inmate attempted to assert dominance over the young Cadena. Refusing to submit, Cadena responded with lethal force, demonstrating his resolve and setting the tone for his future within the gang. This act solidified his status among the other inmates, and from that point on, he was regarded as a key player in the Mexican Mafia's rise to power within the California prison system. As Cadena's influence grew, he, along with his close associate Joe Pegleg Morgan, played a pivotal role in expanding the Mexican Mafia's reach beyond the walls of DVI. They established control over various illicit activities within the prison, including the distribution of substances, extortion, and other forms of organized crime. Cadena's vision extended beyond the confines of the prison as he sought to unify various Latino gangs under the banner of La Ime, thereby creating a statewide network of influence and power. However, 
Cadena's ambitions eventually led to tensions within the gang. His attempts to broker peace with rival groups, such as the Nuestra Familia, were met with resistance from other Mexican Mafia leaders, who viewed these efforts as a threat to their dominance. Despite his initial success in establishing connections with influential figures like George Jackson of the Black Guerrilla family and his involvement in Latino political organizations like the Brown Berets, Cadena's peace initiatives were ultimately undermined. The termination of two Nuestra Familia leaders, orchestrated by Mexican Mafia, effectively ended Cadena's hopes for a truce and marked the beginning of his downfall within the gang. As his influence waned, Cadena became a target for retribution. On December 17, 1972, while at the Chino Reception Center, Cadena's fate was sealed. Despite receiving warnings and knowing that his life was in danger, he chose to confront his enemies head-on rather than seek protection. That morning, he stepped out of his cell and was met with a brutal assault by members of the Nuestra Familia. They repeatedly attacked him, leaving him gravely injured and tossing him from a third-story tier to the concrete floor below. Despite the severity of his injuries, he continued to be targeted until his life ended. Cadena's demise sent shockwaves through the California prison system, sparking a wave of violence that claimed the lives of numerous inmates in the ensuing months. The animosity between the Mexican Mafia and the Nuestra Familia intensified, leading to an ongoing cycle of retaliation that has persisted for decades. To this day, the Mexican Mafia continues to view members of the Nuestra Familia as enemies, a legacy of the conflict that began with Cadena's tragic end. Rodolfo Alvarado Cheyenne Cadena was buried at Union Cemetery in Bakersfield, California,